If you liked this episode of the Hockey IQ podcast, please leave a like, a comment, and especially review our podcast. If you truly listened all the way to the end and you're listening to this right now, you enjoyed this episode. Please go and give it a five-star review. That helps us out more than you know. Thank you so much and look forward to the next one. On the Hockey IQ podcast today, we bring on Mark Letestu, uh, the mustard man himself. Really excited. Uh, you mean, you, you've been famous for a long time, but obviously you're not on social media. So uh, you did you get to see that huge trend when the mustard came out? Oh, yeah. Yeah, no, it was uh, my phone. Probably as many text messages I've ever gotten after a moment. Uh, I, I didn't, I honestly had no idea what was going on. My phone was going crazy in camp with uh, Winnipeg and I look at it and guys have sent me the memes and, and to be honest, it's the first time it ever happened. Uh, typically a pickle juice guy on the bench. And that's what we carried uh, in Edmonton and Columbus. And so first exhibition game legs aren't quite up to par uh, and starting to seize and seize bad halfway through the game. So I'll holler down to to the trainer. I'm like, Hey, you got pickle juice. You got anything? He's like, we don't have pickle juice, uh, uh, but guys here, Really, really good success with mustard. Mustard? Like, yeah, guys like it. So I asked Adam Lowry, who was on the bench, I'm like, mustard? He's like, yeah, it's great. Kills it right away. So I'm like, all right, give me one. So open her up, take it down, and then same. It's just a mustard man. One time. Nah, now you've got uh, – yeah, you stuck with that one for a bit. That's funny. Man, they couldn't get anyone else. Had to get you. Right. There was some, there's some benefits. I think there's a deli in Toronto sent me a, a package of their in-house made mustards and it, it was, it was fun for a bit. Beautiful. Um, well, being a guy from uh, Cleveland, now that you're coaching up there, I got plenty of deli recommendations. So we will talk about that later. I like that. I like that. Um, well, let's start at the beginning here. So uh, you're a man from up in the Edmonton area. So what was it like growing up? Uh, were you always the, the big guy in the rink? Uh, I, I wouldn't say I was always the big guy in the rink. Uh, you know, as a young player, you know, had success at the minor minor hockey league level. But I, I never played AAA hockey. Uh, I didn't play the the kind of the more prestigious travel programs in the area. I just I played for my town, played for Elk Point, Alberta. And our travel hockey was traveling around to the other small towns and competing. Uh, but, but I was always a really good player. Uh, didn't know exactly what it meant to play at the next level. Uh, so my next level for minor hockey was to, to junior B, which, uh, again, is not a prestigious league. There's not a lot of players that come out of there and, and go on to play um, a super high level of hockey. But it was for me, it was just a way to advance to, to junior A and tier two in Bonneville, where, I kind of found myself as a, as a player and a leader and uh, being relied on to produce offense. And, and from there, uh, college and then pro. So you're not the tallest of players. How did you deal with that natural stigma that gets attached to guys that aren't uh, trees? And then it's something you're always uh, fighting against, even – you know, late in my career as, as a professional, still trying to find, you know, opportunities on the fourth line as a, as a center. Um, it's always easier to defer to the guy that's six, five or six, four takes up space. It's more difficult to play against. Uh, so I always had to be, I had to be smarter. I, I wasn't a, I'm built for comfort, not speed. <laughs> I wasn't a, I wasn't a fleet of foot guy. Uh, but my way to counteract that, uh, lack of speed was to know exactly where I had to be uh, in all situations, systematically dialed, uh, knowing where to be helped me be a step ahead. Uh, so in a way, that was my way to counteract against being a little bit undersized and slow was to knowing where to be. And, and sometimes to my advantage, made me faster and made me harder to play against uh, just to know uh, where the soft spots might have been in coverage. Man, uh, we could dive into that as a hockey IQ uh, podcast. You know, where, where are the soft spots and all the different types of defenses? Uh, what, what? I mean, 
let's get the basics and we'll go back to the story a little bit. You know, like what, what are some of your favorite spots on the ice to go to? And like, what are some, maybe some of the routes you like to get there? Well, and it's, again, as a, as a center, as an offensive player. Uh, and now that I'm teaching it and you get to see it and, I mean, the, the middle of the ice the slot area is obviously where all the goals come from or analytically that's where the heat maps are, right? You want to get to that crease and slot area, but I don't know that it's always just go stand in that area. Cause for me at, at a very base level of uh, teaching, like even my, my children, we want to defend, you know, the net in the middle of the ice. So a lot of defensemen, kind of mindlessly go stand there. So if, if we're positioning ourselves right in the slot, right in the middle of the ice, at times you're, you're in somebody's shooting lane or somebody's going to be in your shooting lane. So for me, I always like to be on the strong side of the ice, the dot lane area where whether it's coverage between the low center and the wingers, and it's a little bit far away for the defenseman. For me, when you start uh, getting into those areas where there's shared coverage or, or the actual – details of coverage breakdown you know for a lot of teams that the coverage of f3 on that dot side where it would be kind of the strong side of the ice that's where a lot of the coverages are focused because it, there, there's a shared coverage and there's always always some time to be alone and available and if you can get a shot off and you get really comfortable picking your spots uh, you're going to get a good look or two a game in that that strong side dot lane area I feel like using the dot is always a good reference point, even for just like getting pucks off the wall. The more I watch the game, the more I notice how pucks just like filter their way there. And the guys that seem to go there uh, are the ones you constantly say, you know, oh man, they're great in support. They're always available. They're basically like a 7-Eleven gas station, always open, that kind of stuff. Um, And I really like one thing you said, because I'm very similar of uh, small and not the fastest. So I found that I also love this trick, which is you want to be in someone's space where they're like, I need to defend that guy, but just far enough away where they're starting to have to ask themselves questions like, should I actually go there or they're going to do it mindlessly. And as soon as they do, boom, they've just left good space and you're attacking them either with a speed differential or you're laying pucks in there and letting someone go into it. Uh, That's awesome. And then I love the like between, between coverages like knowing the basic like i feel like every single team especially in youth hockey plays the same system you got we'll just say in the one in the strong corner so you got one d going to the corner you got center probably helping then you got the net front d you got the winger uh usually in in the middle by the dot giving you up the wall and then the other guys hanging out in the slot ish area so just with that general location, okay, where if you were going to be a support guy or looking to get pucks, where would you want to be? Which goes back to that, that dot of being a really nice spot where it's just a little pop. doesn't have to be too hard and you're, you're golden. And then you're just figuring out where's the slide coming from after that. Exactly. And then once you, and as a coach, you know, that's obviously the, the coverage you're trying to relate to your team, trying to give them the patterns where, if it's that weak side forward that's always coming over to the dot, well, now, okay, our weak side defenseman, let's start activating. Let's start giving him something to think about. So what we've done on the dot is hopefully you're pulling the defenseman away from the net because we've already talked about that crease slot area being where we want to get the puck, where a lot of the goals are scored. So now we're making that defenseman make a decision. And if the weak side winger is his responsibility on the dot, now we're making him make a decision. So, once you start giving really high skilled players, you know, the, the McDavid's, the Kucherov's, those guys, once you start giving them options to beat you, that's where defenses have a really tough time because you feel like you're damned if you do, you're damned if you don't, right? You go sit on that guy at dot. Well, now I'm going to hit the weak side guy and you got McCarr coming downhill. Well, you know, is that a better way to get scored on than, you know, Nichushkin just sitting in the slot hammering pucks? So you, you, they start giving you options of how you would like them to beat you. And a lot of times that's where you see the coach, you know, the, the, the new NHL coach looking down at the screen between his feet. And sometimes they just make a play and they beat you and you give them the hat tip because you gave them the option to beat you that you are willing to live with. And sometimes, and most of the time that is the weak side D. Yeah. The, the person away from the puck 
like the furthest away from the puck, you would think, ah, no big deal. But really, if that player is engaged, uh, there's a lot of offense to be had. Uh, and even just positioning yourself maybe for the defensive side of it too, and just that preparation for the next sequence, never taking a mental minute off. Uh, I know that always annoys me as a, as a coach is when you see a defenseman who's on the weak side, whether it be on the breakout or in the offensive zone, and you just tell that they're completely switched off. They're just standing at the blue line rather than being engaged. And it's like, oh, the puck finally got to me. Now I'll play rather than playing all the time. Right. And I think that sometimes it's just the the, the engagement level of, of specific players uh, where they're probably missing out on a few opportunities a year where that player that can keep engaged in the play and and honestly read what's happening in front of them, possibly through two or three layers, but know that He's the player that's open, and sometimes you just got to get it on that side of the ice. So I think what we're kind of getting at is um, from an offensive perspective, you, you hear a lot of coaches talk about problem solvers, and you and I are talking more about guys who are active, engaged, and problem creators, which might blow some people's minds of thinking about, oh, maybe I want players that are actively creating questions and problems of the defense, kind of like you mentioned with McDavid, you know, he's giving you two options. You choose one and he's got the other one. So either way, you're probably screwed. So make your read, make it quick. So everyone can slide faster. If you are going to get beat. Oh, right. And you're, and you're talking again, I, I brought the names up, but the Connors and the, the Nate McKinnons, those guys, they're doing things at such high speeds that the problems they create, it's almost too quick for you to react properly. You're just making a decision because you're like, Oh my God, he's flying at me. I got no gap or in my zone. He's, he's turned up and I got to attack this guy because he's the best player in the world, but they're, they're playing at speeds and and that decision-making that problem creating and problem solving your, your microprocessors got to be so high uh, because that's their advantage, their feet, their hands, everything's moving at the same speed. They're, they're creating these, two on ones or three on ones. And, and it's happening before you, you make a decision, you go back and watch it on video and you're, you're like, Oh my God, that's so obvious. I should have done it this way. But in the moment when you're looking him eye to eye and he's flying at you, you're just reacting. And that reaction time to me, that's the difference in hockey sense is the person that tends to make the right decision at the highest speeds. That's the hockey sense that people are like, Oh, you can't teach it. And I think, I don't know if there's a way to teach it, but I think the more you play and the more you, you see situations and play at high speeds, hopefully you're going to make the right decision more often than not. Yeah. Um, I'm going to summarize this and then we'll move on is, is we want players that are asking offensive players that are asking defenders questions. Like if you're asking them questions, that's a good spot to be in. That means you're being proactive, actively being able to read the game. So um, love that. So you spent four years in the AJHL and then you, you were like every top prospect one and done in the NCAA classic. Uh, what, what was that transition? Like, you know, one, well, let's actually back that up. What was the process of developing and taking a step further and further each year, uh, during your four years in that league? Well, and that it's an interesting one because, I really didn't go there as a, as a blue chip prospect. Uh, again, I came out of the junior B league, uh, which was a local team, 20 minutes from my hometown. And now I'm going to play junior A in Bonneville, which is 30 minutes from my hometown, it, essentially all local. Um, and my coach at the time was Jeff Pister. And I would respectfully say he is not an X's and O's guys, really not a, not a great uh, tactician of the game. Uh, but honestly, I didn't need it. He was he was more of a, a recruiter, more of a motivator, uh, and he, he just let us play. It was a lot of free play, a lot of creativity, uh, a lot of finding offense, um, a lot of shinny almost, <laughs> which is not a, you know, as a coach now, you're like, it, it's very hard to just open up the gate and tell him to go play. Uh, but at that specific point in my career, it actually was very, it's probably good for us really good to to be creative and kind of just go score at all costs where you, you're not worried about systematic play uh, you're just worried about creating offense and having fun and making passes and so we we had some successful years but always fell short 
always fell short in the playoffs because we didn't have that structure. Um, and, and setting that up for me, spending four years uh, in that league is, is probably too long. Uh, but it was what it was at the time. And by the time I got to the end, I was 20. It was much older than a lot of the players in the league and very comfortable scoring. And um, I went to college just overripe. Like I, I was 21 year old freshman, um, older than a senior on my team at college. Uh, but, but that staying at tier two and really, really developing and learning how to score a couple points a game and, um, it was really helpful for me uh, developing the offensive side of my game uh, going forward. So as you look back, was there anything specific that you thought, okay, I actively intentionally developed this in my game and it dropped these things in, or was it simply just a natural progression as I'm playing shinny, I'm figuring some things out as I go along. Did you have a process to this? I don't know that I had a process. I think now that I'm a little bit older and I've played, you kind of reflect on things. Um, a little bit of background. I mean, I was, I was a hockey obsessed person and I'm sure I'm not the first one to tell you that, but like I, I watch a ton of hockey, play video games, hockey, and then practice. And then because I didn't have a job uh, 19 through 20, there was a lot of free ice at the rink where me and a buddy would just go out there and, you know, our morning skate, we're in sweats, just saw some pucks around and hitting one timers and just playing. And, and I, I think there was no process for me to really develop my game, but I feel like I'd seen all the plays, you know, whether you're, you're watching games and actually watching uh, how power plays move and not breaking it down, but just seeing how they score goals. You know, you, you're watching, whether it's shot location, low glove, high glove, low blocker, you start to sense patterns in the way the game's changing. And I always thought that watching the game and being a fan at times for me was, was the best teacher. I, I loved watching the game and I would take something I would see in a game and try it in practice. I worked in practice. I'm going to try it in a game. And fortunately I was good enough or at a level as a 20 year old that I could do a lot of extra stuff and get away with it. So there was never really a, there was never really this worry that something was going to go wrong or I was going to let the team down because I'd had so much success. So I, I, there was a lot of freedom in my game, which, which led to a lot of uh, extra success for me. All right. So one, one point I want to just pull out of that was you played a lot of shitty, you learn through watching, trying things, um, not being worried about having failure. Um, th- there was a good, research like into what are maybe some things that predict future success. So I want to pull those pieces out um, and kind of go over it. Cause through what you talked about um, that actually led to a lot of the key findings um, that they found. So one second here, let me pull that up. Yeah. But it, it was spot on. And one of them was the lack of fear of failure or the, the opposite side of that was like some of the things that led to, um, people who didn't make it it was around just a, a general fear of failure so all right here it is so psychological factors that help predict which you soccer soccer players become professionals it was competitiveness uh self-efficacy so the ability to produce a desired or intended result uh, and then expecting success before it's achieved on the opposite side the factors that had negative predictors were fear of failure body anxiety and disrupted concentration so um the only one i don't think we touched on really was this disrupted disrupted concentration real small bit of a guy who like had a stubborn side to him where you're like i'm gonna figure this stuff out well i get i was just obsessed with it i loved it i loved the game i love success so how am i gonna get that success and and it came through work and um but i don't i don't I couldn't say that in tier two that I was a deliberately disciplined person and, and solely focused on things. And you know, I'm 18, 19. I'm, I'm focused on a lot of stuff. You know, I'm, that's just what it is. But I loved when it was the game. I loved the game and I loved the success. And when I had the skates on and, you know, there was, there was intent to what I was doing. Um, but a lot of the, 
the really, really dialing it in, a lot of that stuff came at the pro level where the, the next level coaching and trying to take my game to the next level. That's where that stuff came in. But for me, tier two was, was a, about a lot more fun. Um, and I, I, I had definitely earned uh, the non-fear of failure. That There's anxiety in my game early when you're a rookie, you're trying to impress people. Uh, but as I got going um, and you have more success and there's four years in the league and you're winning awards, it's just natural to be really confident and not too worried. All right. So we dialed in the systems later. So for all our youth players, parents, coaches, we can understand that it's okay to play free and, and make some mistakes. Uh, systems will come later down the path. Uh, just enjoy the process a little bit of just enjoying the sport um, and all that comes with it. And you don't have to travel all over the place. Like find that level that's right for you. Doesn't have to always be playing AAA or at the highest possible level. Uh, could could be some benefits to playing maybe further down or over a little bit. So through that process, you go to Western Michigan. You're only there for a year. What was that year like from a playing standpoint? Because because I gotta assume you're like you said you're feeling overripe. You're probably expecting a little bit of success. Did it go to the level that you thought you did? Did you think you were gonna be a one and done kind of guy? No, no, I went there to be an accountant. I, had, I mean, the Alberta Junior League paid for my schooling. That was that was honestly the pinnacle of things. As I was. Uh, tier two player that found a way to use hockey to be a vehicle to, to help my education. Um, and Western Michigan was great. They let me defer a couple of years. I'm sure they weren't even worried about me getting there on time. I wasn't an, an NHL prospect uh, at the time, uh, but going in there, I was expecting, I don't know what I was expecting. Uh, you always go in there kind of bright eyed and you're, you're very eager to learn. Um, but you know, I, I still remember the first couple games you get the college printouts and you see kind of all these players and they print it out and, you know, the four lines, the six defensemen, and they've got everybody's draft status and where they played. And, you know, I'm playing against, you know, second rounders, first rounders, third rounders. I'm like, oh, with Cal, like, these guys have been drafted. And, and I remember going through a little bit of a kind of a bit of a honeymoon phase with it where you're like, oh, he's a second rounder. I mean, he must, he must be really good. And then you get out there and, and the more you play with them, you're like, they're not, it, it's not that different than me. Like the separation between a kid that was drafted and, and now three years later, um, it's not that big. So that, that gave me confidence. I'm like, Oh, these guys that are drafted going to the NHL. I don't see much, much separation in us. And then as you get more comfortable with that rubbing shoulders, you feel like you belong and you have success. And then for whatever reason, um, the amount of opportunity I got, uh, amount of opportunity I earned, just it it just snowballed. You just get confidence, and the puck starts flying in the back of the net. And now I'm I'm scoring at a rate that I I didn't think I was going to, uh, but did, and and won a rookie of the year, and you know led the nation in shorthanded goals, and was almost I think it was second in freshman scoring in the NCAA that year. Um, but being 21, it was kind of like, well, he's older than everybody he should be. Uh, but Pittsburgh obviously didn't think so and, and thought it was worth the contract. And um, it's one of the best decisions I made. All right. So you scored the most shorthanded goals. What? How did you do that? I mean, when I think about penalty killers, I think about guys blocking shots, eating pucks, usually got good reach and length. So you're thinking, you know, at least six foot one. You know, what What uh, did you bring to the – the table there and what why did you have so much success scoring those again i think there's a there's a bit of a cheat code in my game is that i i i play the power play i play the penalty kill i played all situations um it, a lot of penalty killing for me is anticipation it's just knowing where passes are going it's reading people's intent with their eyes their hands their feet uh and at the college level um and now now that i know this in hindsight I, I thought I thought at an NHL level, I could process the game. I understood where plays were going. Um, when you have kind of an awareness of what's happening, you can get ahead of the play. You pick off a pass, you go for a breakaway. Pick off a pass, you go for a two-on-one. Um, there wasn't anything systematically 
um, at Western Michigan that was, you know, the thing that separated me from my peers, but just knowing where to be. And again, the college game, there's guys there that are three years younger than me, you know, shaky need freshman supposed to run a power play and he wobbles a puck and, you know, I'm gone. So a lot of it's fortunate, um, but knowing what's happening and being able to get ahead of plays, in my opinion, helps a penalty killer not have to just eat pucks. If you can get ahead of the play and possibly get a stick on a passing lane, because as much as it looks like some people love doing that, it's, it's the worst. So if you can get ahead of it and uh, avoid that, that's probably the best way to penalty kill. Yeah. uh, I like that. And then I I like how you're talking about like being aggressive on bobbled pucks. Like anyone shows you their back or they bobble a puck, pretty good read to give them some pressure and see what happens. Um, Half the time it ends up rimmed on the wall and you get better opportunities. uh, Or like you said, you can kind of pick it and go the other way. Uh, So I love that. And another piece that you mentioned was just around like leading, reading body language. So feet and eyes. uh, Cause so someone once told me that the puck doesn't actually give you any information. Like if you just look at the puck, it will tell you nothing. If you look at the player and read body language, eyes, feet, hands, etc., where they've got their uh, puck positioned, like that will tell you so much that can give you those reads and the ability to, to maybe think ahead uh, rather than just looking at the puck. You have no idea. You're just reacting to the game the entire time. No, and I think that's – I never heard it put that way. Uh, but but I agree with that. I agree other than a goaltender who's always square to the puck. Uh, but as a player, even coaching now you know, on the PK side, you don't want any goal. You don't want any forwards playing goalie. You want them going through the puck. And so we're, we're not playing that position. So I always like to take in all the information, even even his positioning on the ice. You know, if he's got his heels on the wall, well, clearly he's not going to he's not going to beat you to the wall. He just can't. He has only one direction to go. So the ability to take in all that information and then make the right decision um, is key. Unfortunately, there are some players that are so damn deceptive. And that's, again, next level stuff. But those guys, especially in my opinion, defensemen, the guys that walk the line that have so much deception, uh, when you're taking in all that information, that's where you see a lot of guys hesitate because you're just you so worried about getting made look bad. And they're so shifty now. Uh, but the defensemen on power plays, half wall guys that can send a lot of different looks or options with their fakes, uh, you know, opening the blade, closing the blade, moving their feet certain ways. Again, as we talked about earlier, as a penalty killer, you start making decisions when you don't have to. Now you're opening up seams and, and you made to, to look pretty foolish. Yeah. False information, deception, just uh, it makes it tough. I love that. Um, another two things that you kind of mentioned was just around uh, opportunities and confidence. And, and both times you said the same word earned, like you're earning that confidence, you're earning that opportunity. Um, h- how do you earn it? I- I've got to assume it's not just always being at practice and being the most attentive player every single time or always volunteering yourself up for whatever the team needs. No, no. And I, I think it's very cliche to be like, oh, I was the first one at the rink and last one to leave. And I got I, I, that wasn't me. I was kind of very average uh, with my habits, especially in college. Uh, I learned the better professional habits as a pro. Um, but I think one of my one again, one of the abilities that I've had is, is kind of knowing where I where I sit on the team, what my role is, uh, knowing that without being told. Uh, now, as a coach, looking back, um, earning the trust of your your coaches is, is really key. Um, so earning confidence, in, in my opinion, is earning ice time. And the confidence, to me, a coach doesn't have to tell you things with his voice. Uh, a coach will tell you everything you need to know about how he plays you. So if you're getting put on the ice in, in big situations, he trusts you. If you're not, probably doesn't trust you as much as the guys on the ice. So how do I, how do I get that trust? Well, throughout the game, there's a handful of decisions that the coach is sitting there evaluating whether – those decisions are made for the team or they're made individually or are they good decisions? Are they bad decisions? And those add up as the game goes on that when the game's on the line, they're like, I know the decision he's going to make. I I trust it. It's going to be for the team. So I I always had a very uh, mindful game for the defensive side of the puck. I was always very two, uh, two way player, even though I I scored a lot. Uh, 
So that earns trust from, from coaches. You're playing a lot. You're playing in big situations. You're penalty killing. You're power playing. Uh, and a lot of that is not because I was uh, this high pedigree draft stock player that needs to develop. It's because when I was on the ice, my coaches trusted me. And through that, it's just this reciprocal relationship of I'm going to give them good, trustworthy minutes. They're going to put confidence in me by putting me on the ice more. And I just view that's the way it is uh, when it comes to developing confidence. It has nothing to do with I've scored four goals in my last six games. That's that's always the byproduct of the work put in early um, and the trust gained from the coaching staff. All right. I, I like this one scoring is the byproduct. So you're, you're doing the right things. Um, but really just that trust building process, like that is applicable in all parts of life. Like how can you make yourself trustworthy to someone is going to take you a lot further than a lot of other things will. Um, sheer brilliance is great, but if you don't have the reliability and dependability, doesn't really mean a whole lot people want to understand where you stand so I, I love that fact that you're thinking about like how am i able to build trust in the coach how am i able to even better show them because I, I see a lot of players that are like i could totally do this but they don't show it yet once it's shown then it's like okay i'll give them a little snippet and then you continuously earn it and there's more and more trust and like you said it's kind of that flywheel that builds up to more confidence more ice time whatever it may be um, and that's probably the best development hack you can ever have is just be uh, trustworthy to to your teammates and to your coaches. Uh, it's, it's so important. All right. So now we're making the jump to professional hockey. So this is the point where you're making more systematic learnings. Um, you're dialing in your habits away from the rink. It's had, you obviously had some successes soon as you kind of hit the uh the professional level in some capacity but you also had those struggles um what was that process like figuring it out because that, that's probably what it was it's just like i got to figure this out how do i make myself useful how do i be you know be that guy that earns that trust earns that confidence well and i think that's figuring it out is probably the the theme of it uh for me and and up until this point in my career figuring it out uh wasn't difficult it, it wasn't at that time. For whatever reason, uh, things had really been going well, uh, confidence-wise, pucks going in the net. Uh, you get to pro hockey, um, you know, signed a cap deal, which was the most I could get at the time. So I'm feeling pretty good about myself. I think I'm, I think I'm pretty special. Uh, and you get to pro hockey and you figure out everybody's got that deal. You're not that special, right? So it's – and I've got into three games – at the end of my college season came in, played three games of professional hockey and kind of had like a kind of Holy cow moment where it's like, I'm not as good as these guys. Like they are faster. They are stronger. They are better. It's like, this is like, this is way above. I'm, I'm swimming in the deep end here. And, it, and to be honest, it was like nine months from when I finished playing tier two junior, I was in the American hockey league playing against the Hartford Wolfpack and it was Nigel Dawes and Brandon Dubinsky and Dale Purinton looked like the undertaker on the blue line. Like I was just like kind of starstruck and, you know, you'd seen all these guys playing. Um, but I, I, I was a very out of shape kid. I always kind of got by on being smart and being in the right spot and it wasn't good enough anymore. So that, that year I had to go back and I had to really focus on my conditioning, focus on getting my body to a pro level. Cause it didn't matter if my body or, or if my mind could process things at an NHL level, if my body couldn't get me there, it, it didn't matter. So I had to fix that. Uh, I had to learn practice habits. Um, but the, the separator for me is when you're in a, a very highly competitive um, environment, like professional hockey is everybody at that American league level. Yeah. You're on the same team. Absolutely. You're trying to win a, a Calder cup championship, but the, the dirty secret about the American Hockey League is, is nobody wants to be there. Um, that's that's coaches, that's trainers, that's general managers, that's players. Everybody there wants to be in the NHL, and and the reality of that is you're you're competing against your teammates in a sense for those positions. They're very limited. So I had to find a way for myself to separate from my peers. Now, I'm undrafted free agent. I'm against second, first, third rounders, and we're competing. Um, 
they're going to get the benefit of the doubt. A lot of people, whether they're hired or fired, depends on those high picks. So for me, dialing into the structural side of the game, knowing uh, where I had to be, knowing all the plays, all the face-off plays, all the PK, all, all the break uh, breakout routes on the power play, set four checks, set breakouts. Um, I had to be dialed because I wasn't the fastest, wasn't the biggest, didn't have the best shot. Uh, but because I was so dialed in systematic play, um, it got me the opportunities, the extra looks, uh, taking big face-offs at the end of the game. It gave me a role or it gave me the ability to f- grow into a role. And that was probably uh, the biggest thing for me once I had learned the pro habits of getting my body right is just knowing exactly where to be and what to do on the ice that I could play a little more frequently. All right. So you mentioned practice habits. Like what are practice habits? Like let's, let's unpack that box a little bit. Well, practice habits is, and for me again, now it's all hindsight. This is not me speaking at the time. Now I get to coach right now. I'm coaching in Cleveland uh, and how I would relay what practice habits are to uh, my, my players and my kids is that I, I think practice is to develop uh, habits you don't think about. So practice habits. So do, stopping at the net, it's very simple. We always stop the net of practice. And then, you know, as the game goes on, you start stopping at the net. But it, there, there has to be an intent to practice. So when I'm talking about developing habits, it's not working hard. Um, the working hard is, that should be the, ex, it's, that's the expectation. You should never reward hard work. That's just, it is what it is. But for me, habits are how we stop at the net, um, how we compete at box outs, how do we tip pucks around the net, how do we pass pucks, Uh, how do we shoot pucks, how do we defend rebounds, how do we – everything has to be game-like, everything has to be game situation, so that when the bullets actually – start flying in a playoff game in a regular season game that matter. You're not thinking about if I stop at the net, it's just something you do. It's just a habit. So practice for me is trying to develop game-like habits at high speed. So they become natural. So we're not thinking it becomes second nature. Uh, you shoot the puck to score in practice. Now when your eyes aren't on the net and you've got to get a quick shot off, there, there's a certain intent to your shot. There's a location to it. Um, I always talk to my, my players about at the end of practice, like how many passes did you miss today? And, you know, they'll give me a little bit of pause and well, you know, I don't really know. And it's like, well, how do you not know? Like for me at, at an NHL level or a professional level, it should happen so infrequently that you remember them. You should remember two missed passes in practice if that's what it is, or when the last time you missed a practice or missed a pass on tape to tape. And all that is, is just starting to really take ad- adherence to the fine details of the game. Tape to tape is, is the most important thing and executing at a super incredibly high proficient level is the difference between American league and NHL and college and American league. They just execute plays at a higher level. All right. I like that. So we're, we're making habits that we don't currently have, and we're getting to those details. Um, obviously coaches uh, can give it to players, but also as players, we can see the details within the game. Uh, you can go read the hockey IQ newsletter. Why not? You know, yeah. while we're at it, let's just, just push that. You, you can talk details all day there. Take them, run it in the practice. Uh, I know plenty of coaches that give homework uh, of the hockey IQ newsletter. So how do we get those so, and it, like you said, like it has to be intentional. Like if you're not intentionally doing it, it's never going to become something that's unconscious. Like it needs to sink into your system. You need to do it enough times where sooner or later, the first time you're really thinking about it, then you're thinking about it a little bit less, 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 less until you don't even think about it. It's just in, it's a part of your identity realistically here. And, and that's actually probably a good segue to talking about identity. Um, and, and there's for me two aspects. To this one is like, the identity of you as a person and to the identity as a hockey player, like within your game. So I'm curious at what point did you see yourself as like, I am a hockey player. And then how did you see the other part of identity 
like me as a player, like you, you've already kind of touched on this. It's come out and like, I was a responsible player, all of these items. Curious how you see that now as a coach, I was laugh because most players um, like their best three years of playing or the three years that they start coaching and they're done actually playing. Uh, maybe not the case for you. I know you had some, some health at the end of your career, but like, it becomes like, Oh yeah, well, this is so obvious. Like if I knew that I would have been so much better as a player now that I'm coaching it. Well, and, and I, I, it's not just me um, that you come up with these things. I think coaches at times give you roles and they give you identities. Um, and especially at the American Hockey League level where you, everybody there is trying to make the NHL. And now that I'm coaching on the other side, you want everybody to get to the NHL. So you're trying to give them a path. Um, so, you know, what to go back to your questions, when I – probably knew that I was a hockey player. Uh, when you sign the contract, you know, obviously you're, you're earning money playing hockey. So, you know, then you're, you're thinking about it. But when I became a hockey player is when it became a 12 month uh, investment. Um, when I was in college, it was likely eight months, you know, about, you know, a couple of weeks before the season started and a hard stop at the end, you know, I, it's my time now, summertime. And, Junior before that was probably even less, probably didn't do anything, honestly, training until training camp. And, um, so for me, I became a hockey player when it became a 12 month commitment. It was, you know, the summer, you got a week or two and then you're back in the gym and that's, it was your job. It became an occupation, um, which is, which is not a bad thing. You can, you can love what you work, but it became an occupation for me when, when it was a 12 month commitment. Uh, and when I found my identity as a player, um, there is always foundational things in my game that, that exist now that, again, thinking back on it, uh, I was always responsible, always had an adherence to the systematic stuff. And I always believed that most of the best offense that I could come up with came out of the defensive zone where, you know, nothing's in structure. You turn over down low, you got three forwards pinned, you get an odd man rush. So playing the defensive side of the puck always led to offense for me. So I always had a, had a adherence to that side of the game. Uh, I developed face-offs. So it's something, again, I did it with an offensive mind. If I won face-offs, well, it was 10 to 15 points more a year. Later in my career, face-offs became a defensive thing. I'd be the face-off get-off guy. You know, you get out there for eight to 10 minutes a game, but developing face-offs as an offensive skill became a defensive skill. So, you know, in, in Edmonton, I played the power play. Because of faceoffs, uh, penalty killed in Columbus because of it. So it, it gave me options there. So I, I guess part of my identity was a faceoff guy. Um, played on some of the best power plays in the world. So I guess what I'm getting at is my identity was never static. It was never fixed. I was never an offensive guy. I was never a defensive guy. I was always whatever the team needed at that particular moment. And that meant sometimes on the power play, meant sometimes on the penalty kill. So you, you get the sense that, you know, if you had to put the NHL 24 label on it, yeah, you're a utility player. And I think that's just a, a lazy way for saying he's a hockey player. Does a lot of things, right? So if you can't label it, well, we're going to just say he does a lot of good things. But it's there's no such thing, in my opinion, as an offensive guy or a defensive guy. There's guys that produce offense and there's guys that defend well. But they do a lot of the, the in-between. It's just it, it's a little more heavily weighted towards one side. And eventually, Connor McDavid might be a guy that at the end of his career is no longer the same guy. And you have to kind of evolve and um, pick up some of the skills along the way. And I think it transfers very well to all roles. I actually kind of like this. The, the identity is fluid. Um, you know, like there, there's pieces you take pride in, but it's not – always your identity because we, we've all seen the guy who's like i'm an offensive guy and then he gets to a team and he's the low man on the totem pole and if he doesn't change his identity in some capacity uh, he's forever never going to get where he wants to go um unless for some some freak accidents maybe on uh the 10 guys in front of him like it's just going to be difficult so having the identity that's never fixed I think is, is super helpful for a lot of a lot of players and just evolving to figure out what's needed. Um, I think it's definitely something that's come up a bunch of times. It's just like figuring out what's needed. What do I need to develop? Um, I love the idea around face-off. So 
you know, you're one of the better faceoff guys in NHL history. You know, what, what's the process for Mark going into to win more faceoffs and be a dominant guy who's getting opportunities all over the ice on the uh, power play and PK? Well, it's something I had to work at. Uh, I always had pretty decent hand eye, so that that helps right off the bat at the lower levels. I think you can get away with uh, some things just at lower levels. But when I got to professional hockey, where everybody's hand eye is pretty good and and the strength is, you know, comparable to just about everybody. Um, it became, it became a craft like anything. You just start working at it. Uh, and I still remember Ray Shiro after my uh, first year pro. It's like, hey, we have an absence of right-handed centermen. We got Malkin, Crosby, Stahl. They're all left-handed. We need a right-handed centerman. So if you can figure this out, there's a spot for somebody like that, or there's there's a crack, you know, like you, there's a way in. So it was something, you know, I wanted to play in the NHL. I got the answers to the test from the GM. Well, well let's apply that. So it became something I really focused on. Uh, now it's something I still work on with, with my guys because it's, it's part of my responsibilities. But there's always going to be a me versus you mentality to face offs. There's, there has to be a competitive, uh, drive in, in a good face-off man. And I believe all of them have it. There are, there are technical things. You know, I, I believe that taking a face-off, that there's a forward push. If you go back and watch face-offs in most games, the player that gets his nose over the dot or gets body position tends to win most of them. And that, that's got a lot to do with second pucks because guys, the strength is comparable. The hand eye is very good. So the guy that gets that forward push, gets over the dot, generally gets the second puck. And that's a lot of the, the difference in the guy that's 48%, the guy that's 55. It's really not that many. Um, so there's that. And then I, I am a huge baseball fan, and I use a lot of analogies in, in hockey with baseball. And I always uh, talk to my centermen about having multiple looks, right? So you, you've, you've got your A move. you got your fastball. That's the one you're always going to – that's the one you're always going to use when the game's on the line. You got to have your A move. It's the one that you think you're going to win the most of the time with. But when you start getting into the neutral zone and you start getting in center ice and even sometimes in the O zone, I, I want my centerman to give different looks, especially to the, if you're going against one guy all night. You have to throw a change up. You have to throw a curveball. You got to take a stick. You got to you got to give him different looks. So when he comes into the the circle he's maybe on his heels. He's thinking about what you're doing. Now you've controlled the dance a little bit. You've, you've pulled to your backhand a couple of times. Okay. Now we're not going to pull to our backhand. We're going to, we're going to foot jam. We're going to pick a stick. We're going to go to our forehand, just giving the other guy some different looks, just things to think about uh, knowing that you still got your a move. And especially maybe you go over four over five to start a game. You're like, Oh my God, my percentage tonight's going to be rough. You know, you got to get back in the game. You got to win some face offs. So, I do think uh, there's a little bit more uh, sloughing faceoffs than than the usual fan uh, sees, but a, a off ice or offside faceoff dot second period got nothing to it. I don't mind the guy trying something different just to give the other guy a different look, give him something to think about. You're not just going fastball every time. I like it. Um, yeah, I love the nose over the dot. It's something I, I do. The, the only thing I would maybe add that I think is really good um, is if you can, and, and this is not so much at the professional level because it's a lot tougher, but at the, the youth level, like you can normally be the last guy to the dot, last guy to the party, and you can just read what is the other guy trying to do. Um, so for me, I want my centers, one, just general awareness is, you know, you've got kids trying to become, you know, men naturally. Uh, having awareness of your surroundings is great, but then also – being able to read and make a decision based on the other guy, you know, what is their handedness and how is that going to affect me? Um, you know, do, do I want to keep my hands clean or do I want to go hard? Like you said, with that forward lean, that forward push uh, right away and just kind of jam it and tie it up. So like, there's so many little details with face-offs. I find the real hockey nerds truly enjoy it, whether they were a face-off guy or not. Cause there's that, like you said, that one-on-one -on -one, figure it out, like just pure competition um, where everyone's, got something to bring to the table uh and it, it's kind of like and in american football the uh offensive line defensive line like there's that cat and mouse game because you're going to see that same person over and over and over and how are you going to like throw them off a little bit 
change it up where now they're on the back heel. Now you get them thinking too much um, and you're able to take advantage of that to a competitive uh, standpoint. Yeah. And I agree a hundred percent with you that it, there's, there's some details in face-offs that, you know, even, even the broadcast probably couldn't even explain to you, but even the, the minor details of whether my swipes going over his stick, under his stick around, you know, how's the setup of the other guys he going to his forehand. Okay. Well now I'm just blocking. Like there, there's a lot of different uh, details and, and there's a lot of thought and work and video and, uh, it's, it's now become a responsibility, almost a primary responsibility of an assistant coach on the staff just to go over face-offs because they lead, uh, to so much good things when it comes to the actual game itself, whether it's possession time, uh, you know, if I lose the face-off in a 45 second shift, now I've got to spend 15 seconds trying to get the damn thing back. So by winning the face-off now I'm on offense, you know, more, more regularly. And we probably we attribute probably 15 to 20 goals a season, just an offensive zone face-offs and being, you know, being proficient in those. So I, I it's something that's very, very important. Uh, and those details again, separate, you know, your, your Patrice Bergeron's from the rest of the world. All right. I got, I got two things left for us here. Um, one is we're, we're naturally going to lead into this here, which is uh, coaching. Um, actually providing that path, being specific, Rather than now, you need to work harder. And you're just not 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 getting it done right now. Like the coaches that can't see the detail. Obviously, you've been a guy who's been able to see some detail through your career. But it always annoys me as a coach when I hear other coaches being like, "You got to work harder." What the hell does that mean? Um, and being able to provide that path, and you're trying to provide it from the AHL to the NHL. Um, is that something that that's always annoyed you, or is that something you've picked up now as a, as a coach? No, and, and I agree with you. At times, you know, you'd hear, well, you just got to work harder. Well, that, <laughs> it's impossible to quantify. Like, what's what's working hard? You know, and just put my head down, skate into the wall. Like, there's – and I do agree. I think there's some guys that need to work harder, but I don't think that's the way to put it. I think, uh, you know, I think some guys need to compete harder, and I think you can show tangibly – where they're not competing. I think when you talk about hard work at the, at the professional level, especially hard work, everybody's working hard. Everybody's working hard. Some, some don't compete as hard. Uh, but I always think that what was important for me as a player, and I think that's why some, some, not all coaches that, that have success, they've played and they can take the lessons and what they liked as a coach and what they didn't like as they were being coached, I should say. I always like to know why. Todd McClellan was the best coach I ever had at explaining the why. We play systematically because of this. You know, we compete this way because of this. We have this habit because of this. So we stop at the net for offense. We break out the puck for offense. We. So for me, when I'm breaking it down with a player that's maybe going through it a little bit, he's not competing. I'll show him the video, you know, we will have a discussion about it um, where I think he can be a little bit better. I think he can compete harder. Right? And, and a lot of it is second and third efforts. It's not necessarily the first, it's the second, third efforts where I think they can improve. Like, Hey, this guy beat you here. He didn't beat you because he's better than you. Okay. Let's, let's get our body inside. Let's, let's protect the puck. Let's get our nose over the puck. Let's stop playing at the end of our stick. The reason we're doing this is because I want the I want you to have the puck on your stick. You get to play more offense. You get more offense. You feel better about yourself. We get thinking about a call up, right? So there's there's always has to be a path for the player. And I, I I think when you revert back to the guy that or the coach that would say, "Hey, just work harder," it's like, well, why, right? Like, and I get it because you want them to play, but players don't react well to that. They think they're being hollered at. They think they're and I, and I disagree a little bit with the modern athlete is soft. I think they're not soft. I think they want to be pushed. I just think they want to know why. And I think if you give them a roadmap to, hey, I think you're going to have success. This is how I think you're going to have success. And I can tangibly show you skills that you can improve on. And maybe competing is that skill. We can get body position. We can get inside. We can create contact. They embrace it. 
and they apply it. And ultimately I believe they have more success because of it. Yeah. It's the first thing I tell anyone I bring on staff, like we are going to be specific in our feedback. There, There's so much. Mm, yes. I'll leave that there. Drop that. We'll let everyone noodle on it. Take it away for themselves. Uh, what that means in, in many aspects of your life away from just hockey. Uh, last two little bits here, a little more quick fire. Um, I know that you're a fan of flexibility and you have to have the strength, but there's a lot to be said about modern day strength and conditioning that goes beyond just being a, a big meathead uh, and lifting as much as you possibly can. Curious for you to just dive uh, into that and then we'll, we'll wrap up with some fun times. Yeah. And, and I, I, I guess, I guess came up early to late, I guess early two thousands, uh, add strength, add strength, add strength. So I was your typical meathead lifter. You know, you, you throw a lot of bar on there or throw a lot of weight on the bar, you get under it, you squat. And, and I got really strong, which, which is great. Um, but I believe that, and then possibly having all that strength helped me get to the NHL. I it probably didn't hurt. Um, I don't know that it was the only reason, but it probably didn't hurt. I, if I could go back and do it over again, I would, I would try and be more functional. Um, what held me back as a player was my foot speed. I don't know that that can be developed in your mid thirties. Uh, when I, you know, really or early thirties really tried to start focusing on it because you, you feel the game pulling away on you a little bit, you know, so you're, you're working on it, but I wish at an earlier age, uh, that I got connected with strength and conditioning uh, that was more about your plyometrics, more about some explosive movements, more about being functionally strong. Because uh, I, I believe that when I first had a, a growing injury late, uh, kind of mid-middle of my career, my first stint in Columbus, we had spent a lot of the summer trying to gain range of motion. Range of motion. So you're constantly stretching, always, always stretching. And I think at times... I didn't strengthen the new range the way, you know, you develop this extra three inches and you're growing or you're stretched out, but you never developed the strength to go with the range. And I think things had let go. Uh, so I, and there's no blame in that. I think that's just <clears throat> being conscious of, of how you're training, but I wish that I had gone uh, back and I'd been rangy and mobile. And hopefully that would have given me an extra half step. Uh, I think there is a place for putting some weight on a bar and getting a little stronger, but I don't know that it has to be the central focus of your training. I think the, the explosiveness, especially with the way everybody skates now, uh, is critical. All right. Anything else that you'd go back and uh, would like to harp on or something that you're passing back to your current players? You're like, ah, if only I knew. Uh, well, it, it, a lot of it has to do with me being a coach now uh, and and sitting in in those shoes now. Um, the common the common thread you hear with a lot of people that maybe have, have their career has stagnated or something uh, it's not going well is that the coach hates me. Coach hates me. I have never met a player, and again, I I don't think I'm unique in this situation. I've never met a player I didn't like or I, I hate it. I think the biggest and most rewarding thing in coaching is, is having people, no matter who, move on and play at a higher level and get to experience possibly even their dreams. It, I, I, I love my call-up, my first call-up. I've since probably sat in on two or three dozen of guys' first call-ups to the NHL. They're as rewarding as mine. I truly, truly enjoy it. So I say that because I want success for every player that I've ever coached. That's just a fact. I, I want that. They want to work with you. And at times, coaches have to have uncomfortable conversations with players. It's not that they hate you. It's that sometimes people need to be pushed in certain directions for you to, to realize some dreams. So when you think that a coach or somebody of authority is holding you back, I would say internally look at it and see if he's not trying to help you. Are you playing the way you should be? Are you playing for the team first? Are you better than the guys you think you're better than? Have those honest conversations. 
And I think if you can have a little bit of self-awareness and really embrace what the man or lady's trying to tell you, I think you're going to find yourself in a better spot instead of giving a whole bunch of resistance and thinking that the next travel team or the next pro team or the next coach is going to give you the answers you want to hear. Sometimes you got to embrace the ones that you're getting and see if you can apply them and hopefully make some strides that way. Uh, yeah, that kind of feedback and coaching truly is a gift, but you got to handle it as a gift. Um, yeah, I don't know any coaches that have actively hated any players. They just want the best for them, which, like you mentioned, sometimes is uh, pushing you into spaces that at first you may not want to go into or mental spaces that you don't want to go into. So that that's uh, that's a great point. Um, anything else on your mind? Uh, otherwise, I, I would say, you know, we'll go have our morning cup of joe, but I know you're not a coffee guy. No, no, I'm a big I'm a big coffee guy and I'm definitely going to go have a second cup. <laughs> I thought you were a no coffee guy for a bit. I was. My wife introduced me at about 33, 35, and now I'm all in. Got the hooks in me. So it was oh, something no. I just, yeah. And it's great. It's it, I look forward to it every morning. <laughs> there you go. Figuring it out, having some uh, development of yourself, figuring out what, what's, what might be a little bit better. I, I'm still on the no coffee train. <clears throat> My wife's Hi. big. I, I'm out on it. I'll do some tea. But uh, my, my God has blessed me with energy and uh, adding coffee to that energy is usually a bad thing. I, I, I know some people, but I, I'm in the coaching world now. So I'm a, I'm a pot every morning trying to figure stuff out. So it's, uh, it's, part of the, it's part of the uniform. Love it. Mark, thanks so much for coming on. Really appreciate you taking the time and then sharing your wisdom and uh, a little bit of your story. I think there's a lot to be taken away. And I, I know I'm actually going to send this to my uh, entire team whenever it's released. I appreciate it. Thanks a lot, Greg. That concludes this week's episode. Thanks for joining us here at Hockey IQ. If you haven't already, take a quick moment to hit that subscribe button, give us a thumbs up, and drop a review. If you want to be a great teammate, even recommend us to a friend. You can follow us at Hockey's Arsenal on Twitter and Instagram. Check out the website, Hockey'sArsenal.com, where you can subscribe to the weekly newsletter. You won't regret it. Catch a Buttes here next week for a brand new episode.